Hey, you made it. Welcome to Create Out Loud. I'm Jennifer Loudon, and this is the very first episode of our new podcast. As you probably guessed from our title, this is a creativity podcast. My goal with this show is simple. I want you to be inspired every week, but I want you to learn something or more than one somethings that you can put in your creativity toolkit so you can create out loud. And what do I mean by that? I mean, get your work out there, make it, share it. How are we going to do that? We're going to talk to some of the world's most successful creatives in all areas, writers, poets, illustrators, musicians, creative entrepreneurs. We're going to talk about the nitty gritty of their work, the fun stuff like how do they get inspired and what do they do in the morning? But we're going to talk about the hard stuff like how do they deal with envy and silencing those damn inner critics. We'll even talk about the awkward stuff like how they make money. And I said we'd be talking to successful creatives and so we're going to just hit the ground running with our first guest, Annie Lamont. She's a seven time New York Times bestselling author. Whoa! I'm sure you know her work. Her book, Bird by Bird, is considered one of the best and most influential books about writing and creativity ever written. You got a copy, right? We're gonna be talking about her newest book, Dusk, Night, Dawn, and you're gonna hear me cry. And you're gonna hear me talk about faith and not having any right now. And yeah, who knew your first podcast episode out of the gate, you'd be in tears. I was scared to interview Annie. You know, she's famous. I really didn't need to be. And that's so true for so many things we do when we create out loud. So I don't believe in signs, but yesterday, just yesterday, I'm watching my favorite show, Vida, on stars, and they mention you. And then we get into bed, and my husband is looking at Instagram, and Matt Haig, one of my favorite novelists, quotes you. What's it like to be such a part of popular culture? Does it mess with your head? Does it make it harder to keep writing this beautiful new book? Um, well, I don't ever, I really, really don't think about it. I don't, didn't know about these two things you just <laughs> referenced and because I'm really out of the loop and I can't really do anything electronic. So I sort of lurch along and I see what I see. And sometimes it makes me really happy. And like this morning, I got a really mixed review in the Boston Globe, and that made me really, really mad. So, <laughs> but I mostly don't think about it. And I luckily, um, it just kind of goes on in the background of my life. Oh my God, that's terrific. I love that. Do you think God is a writer? No. Although I do think God is a creator and co creates with us. I think it's like having a really fabulous, trusted, collaborator who's really, really safe for you to try out new ideas with and who who both of you bring something to the table of um, that sort of a combination of elbow grease and, and little sparkles of insight and, and memories and, and nudges. I think God in her infinite Jewish mother dis, disguise uh, does a lot of nudging. <laughs> I like that. Um, what does your faith feel like? What does it feel like in your body? I, I, when I read about your faith life and your prayer life, and I'm someone who's been a, a spiritual and religious seeker most of my life, but the last few years have been a really dry period for me. They're, I have, I'm having the least spiritual life I've ever had in my life since I was little. Uh -huh. And I think about your spiritual life and, and it makes my heart full and happy, but I, I just wonder what it's like from the inside. Um, well, you know, for all of us, some days go better than others <laughs> and some days are just too long. And I really think the last four years were just too long. <laughs> and the, actually the reason I wrote Dust Night Dawn was because with the last book, which was a book on hope, everywhere I went, people didn't feel hope. They didn't feel the spirit. They didn't feel much presence because they had to be so defended mm. against the nightmare and the brutality and the indecency of it all. And then the terror, you know, when COVID struck a year ago, year over a year ago. So what it's like for me is some days I just feel kind of, you know, blah, not blase. Yeah, kind of blase about it. But I take the action anyway. I, I wake up and I say my prayers, you know, and I I, uh, I say a prayer of turning it all over to God and his or her infinite weirdness and, and goodness. I believe in that. And, uh, you know, then I put on my glasses, I let the dog out to pee and I do my day. But during the day, I really focus whenever I can 
on both the beauty around me, like right now we have daffodils and little green shoots breaking through the concrete. And I focus on the needs of others. And I, um, you know, you see the footage on TV of the long, long lines at the food pantries around the country and around the world. And so I, I do a lot, I do whatever I can one day at a time to get food to hungry people and especially to hungry children. And to me, that's the Jesus -y, most Jesus-y thing you can do is to, you know, f feed hungry children, <laughs> you know, and you don't have to figure out anything. Figure it out is a bad slogan, but if you get thirsty people water, even if it's, you know, annoying and disappointing you, and you feed hungry children, then for me, that's enough. I stay sober one day at a time. I have a community of, of sober people and I go to this funky little church on Sundays with 30 other people. And, um, and I really, really love those. And I love them on Zoom, you know, where it feels like you're looking at an advent calendar. <laughs> their, face, their faces I love and that really, really connects me to something bigger than my own kind of troubled and shut down mind. Do you, does your faith help you write or help you keep writing? Um, that's a good question. I, um, I could probably preach it or, or write an essay about it, but um, my faith is really everything. I mean, it's like my heartbeat and it's what I'm most grateful for that I do believe that there is a deeper and more, more beautiful reality than the visible one and especially the stories I make up about it. And, um, and the self-righteousness and victimization that spring from the stories that I make up about it. <laughs> and, um, but sometimes I pray, God help me get out of my way so I can write what wants to be written. I always write, I always tell my writing students, write what you'd love to come upon. And, you know, two years ago when I started Dust Night Dawn, I would have loved to have come upon a book that was sort of operating instructions for such a long dark night of the soul so um i write what i'd like to come upon and i i uh i write stories i just love that helped me have a a little awakening you know it helps spritz me back to the present moment the holy moment and help me i hope get my sense of humor back because that's also about as spiritual as it gets yeah i um I've been learning about this concept time anxiety recently that and shows up in some different ways. But one of the ways it shows up for me is always feeling like I'm not doing things fast enough. Right. And one of the ways out of time anxiety is to really remember in the moment, what do you value most? And when I made a list of my values recently, the top one was laughter, you know? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> and it really well, helps. Also, the worst thing is the perfectionism which I wrote about in Bird by Bird, and, and that by extension is trying to get one more thing done, one more thing done, mm -hmm. one more thing done. So spiritually, if, if you came to me and said, I'm, um, I just feel really flat spiritually mm -hmm. and, and by extension creatively, mm -hmm. um, I would say um, do less and do it more poorly, you know? And um, try, try more and do it badly. If fall on your butt more often, life will always pull you back to your feet and, um, and do less. Like for me, I could go sit outside in the garden with the dog and just breathe and, um, you know, breathe a little Thich Nhat Hanh mantra. The greatest mantra in history is breathing in, I calm myself, breathing out, I smile. And it's just a tiny <laughs> smile. It's not like a Pepsi didn't smile. <laughs> do that but before I do it I'm always trying to get myself to do one more thing right. I meant to put the, the clothes in the laundry before I zoomed with you and when I'm going to go for a hike in a little while which is my spiritual practice I really am going to be desperate to stop off at Walgreens and get the graph paper that I've been trying to remember I don't need the graph paper this morning but it's on my list and so what I do is stuff that really is the nourishment of my life, the bread and the, and the grape juice and the, um, the water, the hydration, and not the stuff on my to-do list. So spiritually, if I were your minister or rabbi or imam, I would say do less, waste more time and do it badly. Yeah, that brings tears to my eyes. Yeah. 
first podcast episode and crying like a baby. Well, you know what? How much is our emotional life, our spiritual life, and our creative life intertwined? Okay, I think deeply. What do we need to do to release the stress cycle, to recharge ourselves that may not look like self-care with quotes, but truly is radical self-care as Andy's going to talk about. Honestly, I tend to be someone who puts things in silos. Here's my creative work. Here's my to-do list. Here's my, you know, growing my business work. The more I listen as Annie spoke, the more I really got how intertwined everything is for her and could be for all of us. The more I realize how intertwined everything is, which is like, as one friend of mine calls it, a duh epiphany. Duh epiphany. Where is our creative life falling apart? Where are we getting in our own way? Because we're putting things in silos, because we're not allowing ourselves to cry or rage or rest. That brings me to something you said in an interview with Kate Bowler, who is, I believe, a friend of yours, a historian at Duke Divinity School on our podcast, Everything Happens. And you said something about, I've been faking it my whole life, half of the time, and I'm just done. I don't know how much time I have, but I'm not going to fake it anymore. And that is an experience I'm having, but I still get caught in faking, you know, making nice. Oh, we all do. What my friend said was, I have been being a good sport for my entire life. She's 72. And she said, I'm just done. I'm just done. And um, that (laughs) for me means, of course, we're all faking it. That's not a sin or a, um, a, a character defect. It's that we were raised to, we were taught to, And it's a long road back from always trying to be on, always being a good sport, always seeming to have it together. I mean, we were raised to get our act together, right? And if you live by that, what do you have? You have an act. You're a performance artist. You're not a human being. You're not a both in the dual citizenship of being a person with a biography and a past and a career and a what a family and a divine child of divine child, all of a sudden you're a, per, you're a performance action. You're always pretending to be doing okay. I was raised by an English woman and I was raised that no matter what the, the appearance, the surface must look good. You yeah, must be too. acting in such a way that everybody thinks the whole family is doing really well. Mm-hmm. And at what point do you decide not to live that way anymore, more to be who you were actually born to be? You know, when I was a child, I came, I think I'm a lot older than you, but I came up in the 50s. And the whole thing was that you shouldn't ex- uh, exhibit any emotions that were unpleasant, like anger or tears. And I was very sensitive. But when we, if I had anger or tears at the dinner table, I went to my room without eating, you know? And if I um, brought home B pluses, my parents said, and they were very good parents. They said, this isn't a criticism, which was the great palace lie. (laughs) They would say, uh, how much harder would it have been to get an A minus? However, if you'd gotten the A minus, the question was, was there time in the quarter for you to bring that up to an A. So you really can't win by losing for losing if you live by those old rules. And I was learned to keep I learned my mom was really heavy. She was had an eating disorder and she was very heavy. And, and I learned that the most important thing for a woman was to keep her weight down. And what that meant was a woman should be small and a woman should not be juicy. A woman should not be exuding all this creative and spiritual and intellectual and emotional energy because it made the men feel bad about their own constricted lives. And in fact, in, in school, in elementary school, my, I was really good at math. I, it turned out I was way too good at math. And it made the boys feel bad because the boys were supposed to be the ones who were good at math, right? Mm-hmm. And so I learned to hold back. I learned to stay small. And, uh, and so it's time, like none of us knows how much time we have. Kate Bowler, who's so profound, has four stage cancer, you know, she doesn't know, but you don't either. I don't either. We mm-hmm. don't either. Both of us are not positive that if we meet back in a year, which I'd be glad to do, if both of us are still alive, yeah. you know, and so what do you have? You have right now, you have the spring 2021. And what are you going to do with this precious spring that has followed the most ghastly year-long winter of our American lives. Yeah, that makes me want to weep too. You're making me cry. That's a good thing though. But, it is a good you know, thing. We, were, we were institutionalized to not cry. It, when I was a child, 
and I was so sensitive, it was the, the battle cry to our family was, oh, for Christ's sake, Annie, now what? Oh my God. Right? <laughs> because maybe the National Geographic came and I could see that the kids in India had flies on their foreheads or we'd gone to the pound and I was six and I could tell that most of the animals weren't going to find homes. They weren't all going to come home with us. <laughs> and I cried, I cried. My parents were so unhappy. That made me very afraid and I cried. But as I grew up and as I got sober, I got sober almost 35 years ago, I learned that anger, the forbidden emotion for all women, uh, I mean, they used to kill angry women now, and then they put them in mental institutions when I was coming up, and now they just divorce you. But, uh, <laughs> and, anger, and, 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 and revenge porn. And, and revenge porn, right, right. And, um, and anger and tears are really the way home, have been the way home to my true self and to the heart cave of my spiritual center and my, my soul, which is what Death Night Dawn is almost entirely about. It's mm -hmm. about the renewal of the soul, the reawakening. But if you're crying, that is bathing you and it is hydrating you <laughs> and it is baptizing you and it is growing the seeds that are under the earth at your feet and we don't even know you don't know god may what those seeds are that have been planted by time and trials and and love and grace to, for your next book for your next phase of life which i think is going to be uh, a renewal for you spiritually i really do i can tell i can mm -hmm. feel because you're crying that it's really really deep inside of you and that you are really you know what you are you're available <laughs> <laughs> You are available for the revival. I want to say amen. <laughs> amen. amen. Um, gosh, okay, so many things from that. So th first of all, thank you. Thank you, really. My, my whole heart feels um, tender and, and uh, yeah, thank you. I, and I think for people listening, you know, what is the, what is that renewal for you, right? What is it? what are these, how are these words also words for you, whether your spiritual life is rich right now and your creative life is dry well, and they are so life, intertwined. My creative life is completely dry right now. Cause I'm in the middle of a, a publication and a book tour. Right. And, um, and my spiritual life is just like everybody else's. I mean, it's a, uh, it cycles. We cycle through, we cycle through flat and we cycle through reawakened and, and, uh, happy you know happy to be here and you know happy that against all odds and and through grace and the love of our very very best girlfriends we got our sense of humor back <laughs> and so the words for me are like remember 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 i have little bits of paper all over my walls and sometimes written on my on the inside of my wrist um that are the mantra for that day you know that that we take the action and uh, you know, that figure it out is not a good slogan. We take the loving action and that gives us loving feelings. And we, when all is said and done, we just take care of the poor. Mm -hmm. And I keep, and, I, and that some, and that my mission is not, if I'm kind of a tired, cranky missionary with sore feet, the, the mission statement is not to bring justice to the people I'm really mad at, whether they're in Washington or at the dining room table. My mission statement is that I'm God with, uh, what did someone say? It was so beautiful. I'll tell you a really quick story I love, but um, well, this is a story we tell my Sunday school kids of a, a little girl who's in bed, really afraid to fall asleep one night and her mother keeps coming in saying, oh, don't be afraid. God is with you. You know, God's right here. And goes on and on and she calls her mother in so afraid oh Jesus is right here you don't have to be afraid the last time the little girl just says oh I'm just I'm just really feeling sad and worried and the mother says I have to go back to my room but God is with you and the little girl says I need someone with skin on you know and I think that's what my mission statement is is that I need to be someone God in in form with skin on who can go get you a really lovely cup of tea or a couple of bags of, uh, you know, Halloween sized packets of M&Ms. Or I can say, do you wanna go for a walk? Or do you wanna come sit in the garden with the dog and me? We're really doing nothing. You might think we're wasting time, but we're actually filling up at the gas station. <laughs> so. um, when, 
how do you balance your your deep mission of service of being God with skin on with writing a book when it's when it's book writing time or when right now when it's book promo time? Do you how do you deal with that balance? Um I don't, it's hard to explain. And it's such a weird experience to go through a publication in quarantine because I don't leave the house and I do everything online and I do all my bookstore readings online. It's a very different experience because I get so much energy from my audience, at mm. least as much as I pour out into them. But um, the God thing is just as part of the weave of me. You know, I'm a I'm a mother, a grandmother, I'm a wife, I have two pets, I'm in the recovery community, I have a church community, and, it, and, and I, it's all just a weave, you know, it's not like if I'm doing my work or I'm talking to you, I, I ask God to go, um, please sit outside on the front step to go, I'm done. I put the heater on a second. <laughs> it's cold. Um, and when I'm sitting with God outside on the front step, and I'm paying attention, which is the most important writing advice I can ever give anyone. Um, I'm, um, I'm exulting in the miracle that I have of faith in God and goodness and good orderly direction and grace over drama. And at the same time, because I'm a writer available and receptive, these ideas and memories and visions float into my head like goldfish. And because I'm a writer, I've been doing this for 45 or six years now. I always, always, always have a pen with me, always. So I listen to God, I sit with God. I'm, I try to be God's hands and feet for her. And I always have a pen and it's a paper with me because you don't know where the idea, where or when the ideas will come from. And that's, um, I think, what comes across so extraordinary in your writing over and over again, book after book, is that you do pay unbelievably close attention. And there is something when I, I work with writers as well, and when I'm trying to teach them how to write, it's so hard to get that across, how you pay attention. Yeah. And it's hard for me to do it sometimes, too. I mean, I can definitely be off in my stories in my head and not paying attention. You do it so beautifully. Pay attention. God, how many times am I trying to learn that? Sometimes I think that all the things I've tried to cram in my head about writing, about teaching, about the spiritual life, all comes down to that simple, simple instruction. Pay attention. Oh, I was teaching for 20 years or something, and I always use that great Henry James line that a writer is someone on whom nothing is lost. And then I also discovered Ram Dass's book, Grist for the Mill, when I was, whatever, 25 or something. And it, those two things really joined as a banner that I fly over my head, that nothing is lost. And it's all grist for the mill. It's grist for spiritual growth and revival and its possible material. You know? <laughs> and it's like you just, uh, this guy who helped AA get started in uh, 1935, who was not himself an alcoholic, said to Bill Wilson, sometimes I think that heaven is just a, a new pair of glasses. And I really love that line. And a lot of the time I'm walking around with these smudge glasses that are kind of smeared and smeary just from the endless data stream and the muck and the mess of our world right now and the, the bizarre four years of watching the news. And, and, um, and if I intentionally imagine taking off the smudged kind of judgmental uh, glasses and putting on the new ones and I kind of blink awake, I, uh, I can start to notice what is happening right around me right now, which is the resurrection to use the religious term, but to use the pagan term, it's the spring. It's renewal. Every single wisdom tradition on earth gets it. <laughs> I get it and has sacrament and rites that go with where we are right now. Well, it's here now. Am I going to be? Yeah, I was uh, a friend of ours has cancer. She's doing really well, but it was it was a we had a bunch of really cold weather here. I'm in Colorado, and then the weather turned, and I happened to come upon her sitting outside, and we just had a beautiful conversation with that sense of springtime. And just you're right when we when we're there for it and we're paying attention, it does recharge us. It's yeah. it's almost the sometimes it's almost too much the bounty of it. You know, it just fills my heart so much. Sometimes I, I want to run away from it. And, and speaking of running away, um, I, I was married 
little bit later in life at 44 and you were married at 65. And I know yeah. everyone has been asking you and I'm not going to ask you what it's like to be married. Um, but I, I do want to ask you what it's like to be seen in your marriage, because there's a couple pl uh, places in the new book, Dusk, Night, Dawn, page 19. What an odd idea. That's not what I wanted. I thought it was supposed to be more like barefoot in the park, less lifey. I don't want life to be about finding out who I am. And then there's a place on page 141 um, when you're in that, <laughs> when you're in that performance and it's so awful and it's going on and on. You're giving me an anxiety attack when I was reading it. <laughs> uh -huh. And um, you talk about how our partners see our crazy inside shows. Uh -huh. And that almost prevented me from staying in my relationship and getting married because I was so afraid to be seen for who I was. What, yeah. what, what helped you? Or was it a struggle for you? Well, I mean, that's why we're here on earth to be seen, to see and to be seen. You know, there's a beautiful poster at my Instagram that the creatives at Riverhead did where it says a quote that I hope I said, but I didn't, don't remember saying it. It said something that we're here to see and to see it all, not to watch and to look at. You know, because usually if we're watching stuff and looking at it, we have an ulterior motive, right? Yeah, we're far away. We we're feel far away yeah. and, and we're watching it. We're thinking, well, you know, I've actually seen this before and it's nice, but, you know, next. <laughs> but if we're seeing, we've got that possibility of that beautiful, beautiful gift of childhood, which is curiosity. And so um, I'm not hiding and suppressing stuff from my husband or from the world that is beautiful and adorable and compassionate. I'm hiding the shadow. Mm -hmm. I'm hiding the stuff that is so dark and weird and scary that I um, think that if you or Neil could see it, you would just run screaming for your cute little life. And, um, and instead I show it to Neil and he shows me his and we just both nod and we go, wow, thank you. I've got that too. I did that too. I thought that too. I actually thought that this morning. <laughs> so I know how troubling it is, you know, and how it doesn't really go with who everybody thinks you are. But so um, it's been, you know, it's been a trip and not every day is wonderful. And, 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 and real life is hard and intimacy is hard. And um, but we both have a lot of spiritual tools to, to fall back on and that we bring to the relationship. And I mean, I got married two years ago and one year, one whole year, I've been quarantined with the guy. So, <laughs> you know. Trial by fire. Yeah, yeah. I, I asked some of my community for questions to ask you and I got this one a lot. What's your morning routine? What do you do before you write? And oh. I know this is a really common question. I'm sure you've been asked it a million times, but if you would, if you wouldn't mind. I do the same thing every day. Um, really, every single thing I know about writing is in Bird by Bird. And then there's also a writing essay in the um, last book, I believe, the Hope book, um, because I taught a lot of um, workshops to my grandson's class. So kindergartners through sixth grade, <clears throat> I had to kind of gear Bird by Bird to little ones. But I, um, I, have a, I, I stopped not writing. That's the most important thing. I, I stopped the not writing and I realized um, that if I write, I'm going to have an infinitely better day than I'm going to have otherwise. I'm going to feel like I've accomplished something and I've, I've, um, I've met this debt of honor inside of me. I do it by pre-commitment. I don't ever wait for inspiration. I don't ever wait to feel like, oh my God, I have such an amazing idea. <laughs> I don't. I sit down at the same time every single day. And then, which is usually nine, because I have a family, I have a grandkid who might need a lunch for school, I have, you know, a dog, I have a life and, and um, but it doesn't matter, you can, uh, with my writing students, all those years, their main thing they wanted to convey was why they weren't currently writing and how much they were going to start writing as soon as they retired or as soon as their last child left. Um, home and they or, or as soon as they moved to the Russian River where it's really, really quiet. And I always said, if you don't write now, you're not going to write then. It's I think so you true. feel really have really good esteem if you lose 10 pounds. Well, if you don't love yourself and do radical self-care at 160, you're not suddenly going to have a changed feeling about yourself at 150. It's an inside job and there's only right now. And so I sit down at nine 
and I used what the only thing that ever worked with motherhood, which was bribes and threats. <laughs> and I say to myself, okay, Annie, if you write that one passage about being out at the shore at Inverness when you're six years old with your uncle Don, who's drunk, it should take about an hour and, and we can write it really, really badly. You can just spew, it can be four pages, although if we use it, it'll probably be one eventually. If you'll do that with me, then we'll stop and we'll have half of a grilled cheese sandwich. <laughs> or uh, mostly through the last four years, I've gone, okay, Annie, if you write that scene with at the dog park with the stranger who had the toy poodle and she was crying and you prayed together, we'll turn on half an hour of MSNBC. <laughs> and, and that's, how I, that's really how I get anything done. Oh my God, that is hysterical, right? I did that. I don't watch television, but I read the news obsessively for the last four years. It was so, it's so weird to not have that obsession anymore. It's I so know, weird to just go, it's so I'm weird. Really not interested in going to <laughs> Washington Post. <laughs> I know. Well, we woke up for four years, my husband and I, and we said, and he would turn on the news and, and, and there's breaking news, horrific, God awful breaking news, a setback for the poor, for women, for, for people of color, for every other country. And then three hours later, there'd be new breaking news and it would have had nothing to do with the breaking news you woke up to. And then by dinner, there'd be more breaking news and it would be just as awful, but it was brand new breaking news. And now, it's like when you've been, um, you know, you've been living with a gong, a, a, be a church bell outside your window for 20 years and you wake up one morning, it's not ringing anymore, but you're looking around, what's that, what's that, what's that sound? And the sound <laughs> is peace and, the, and wisdom and goodness and- um, Normalcy. And grace over drama. I love that grace over G -O -D, drama. G-O-D, yeah. I love that grace over drama, yeah. Yeah, my husband and I got into a one-upmanship over the last four years to who could get the breaking news first and shock the yeah, other person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like, I, I know, I, it was so interesting to watch our brains do that. Yeah. You talked about radical self-care and self-love. And to, to me, in my experience as a creator, that is, that is what makes creating easier and more possible. And the harder I am on myself and the more cruel I am and the more judgmental of my work, the more tied I am to outcome, the less I work or the or definitely the less I enjoy it. Has that been your experience? Um, my experience is that everything that gives me faith in life and God and goodness and humankind um, begins with radical self-care. Mm. That if I'm withholding from myself, or if I'm just really uptight and pissed off, or um, self-righteous, I would say is my default, <laughs> or blame. I'm usually, I usually go to blame first, like whose fault is, is my discomfort. Um, then there's very, very little flow between my mind and my hands and my heart. And that if I do this weird radical self-care, might be a cup of tea, it might be a hot bath, it might be a walk, it might be that like this afternoon, I'm gonna lie down for a nap when I'm done with all sorts of this promotional stuff, I'm gonna make the kitty take a nap with me and I have the new issue of People Magazine. You know, <laughs> eat your heart out. I don't mean to make you feel worse about your life than you do, but that's a spiritual act. Rest is always a spiritual act. And because I will be doing stuff like that all day, like I just had a really, really delicious cup of coffee and I've moved on to heavy, whipping cream oh yes like, girl oh, oh yes <laughs> I mean I've been on half and half for 10 years and I moved into um heavy whipping cream for publication and it's like so nourishing and it makes me so happy and the the act of me making it is it's like a, a good mother making it for me and saying honey you should have the best you know you should have them you don't need to worry about keeping your weight down. You need to worry about nutrition and, and psychic nutrition and deliciousness. So you just sit down and make you a cup of coffee that's about a third heavy <laughs> cream. Yes.
I love that. Um, it, but it, it brings me to a question that I hear a lot from people, which is how do I negotiate between doing the things I do want to create, the writing, the art, the business, and taking care of myself? Because it seems like a lot of, and I have my thoughts about this, but of course I, I want your thoughts. It seems like a lot of women don't trust themselves. They don't trust themselves. They feel like if they give themselves radical self-care, they will never get out of bed. They will never get off the couch. They will, they will never create what they want to create. What do you, how do you relate to that question or, or find a balance in that? Or do you think it's just a, a, a patriarchal sort of construct? I think it is. And it goes back to what we were talking about earlier that everything in your childhood, uh, institutional and in, within the family was designed to keep you, keep women and girls really, really small and, and, and not juicy. Juicy meant messy and gross. And, um, and th that became our comfort zone. And so everything in me is um, designated to keep me small and not creating because that is the juice, right? My husband has a website you can check out called um, Shapes of Truth, which is the title of his book. And I thought of the title, by the way, it's a great <laughs> title. I just want you to know it's a great title and it's, you thought of it. <laughs> and I thought of it, right? But in Shapes of Truth, he talks about that. He, he works with people individually as on um, taming the inner critic. And he calls it the inner critic or the superego. And I write about it in Dust Night Dawn as being the governess named Dread. And the governess named, the Dread raised me and Dread kept me small, but also kept me, she kept me alive. Mm -hmm. and I didn't run out into the street and I didn't swim in water that was deeper than I could keep afloat and uh, where I could keep afloat and I don't need her anymore. I don't need the inner critic. I don't need the, the um, super ego. So what I do for my creative um, expansiveness and belief in myself is I identify, this is what Neil's taught me, you identify the inner critic and then you, you befriend her. Mm -hmm. Like you befriend fear and grief and acknowledge that they're true and they're real. And so what Neil taught me to do, uh, and his work is um, that you say to the inner, you say to the governess named Dread, oh, hi, thank you. I can't believe you've kept me alive. I'll be 67 next month. Thank you for that. I am wondering, though, if we might find a job that would be more exciting for you than keeping me from running into the street. Now, I wonder if you might want to be the, the, uh, the ethical consultation for, for the house. And we have a library where all the books are in an actually a great easy chair and a good reading light. And you could be in the library. And every time I needed an ethical consultation, I would summon you. And the governess or the superego or the, the uh, inner critic is really excited. It's a very prestigious job. It is. Um, and then <laughs> As I a chair. With me and, and my little kid and my creative soul can do our hour of work before we have the fun-sized Mars bar. <laughs> I like that. I like uh, in, the, in the work I've done over the years with people, naming the inner critic and and, and finding ways to give them jobs or to make them an ally. I mean, I've, yeah. I've found that my inner critic can actually be good at helping me market. Uh -huh. You know, oh, yeah. they can be very strategic. Yeah. And less scared of the world like I am and just want to crawl under the bed. <laughs> I mean, all of this stuff, the fear, the self-doubt, the, you know, it's all what every single writer and screenwriter deals with every day. It's not like we're lesser creatures and we're just more neurotic i mean the the game of the writer and the the screenwriter and the uh and this and the lecturer is that ping pong game between well can i swear on this on your podcast? you can okay i wrote about it in bird by bird there's a radio station that plays non-stop <laughs> yes. you become aware of it and it's called k fucked radio kfkd and out of the right hand speaker is that you're brighter than, you're more sensitive and insightful and certainly more humble. <laughs> and, and then in the left hand speaker is that you're a fraud and that the jig is up and talk about beating a dead horse and, and whatnot. And every single creative in any realm has to face this. And you have to, um, you have to say to both players so on, in both speakers, 
I'm going to need to turn you down briefly. You, you play, you know, you're ex you're both excellent ping at ping pong, but you play and I've got about an hour's work to do. And then I'll meet you back here. It's a trick. You don't need to meet. They don't even need you. But mm -hmm. so there are ways to quiet that. There are ways to um, have it be great material. It's universal though, is the point. And that I tell when I'm speaking on, on writing anywhere, <clears throat> I say every single writer you have ever loved, every book you've foist on people began as an incredibly shitty first draft because the bad, the critic inside of us tells us, oh, Barbara Kingsolver or, or you know, Mary Oliver, they just, this stuff comes through them and they get it down. And it's not true. Every Mary Oliver poem began as being three times too long with way too many adjectives, you know? <laughs> and uh, she did draft after draft after draft. And so did Barbara Kingsolver. And so did, you know, Dr. O. And it's how we get anything valuable written. Yeah, having to love revision. I actually love revision a lot more than I love drafting. So oh, I remembered the question I want to ask you. Okay. One of the things I hear from writers a lot, and I'm sure, again, I know we have creators of all kinds listening, but the, the finding your voice. And, and I wish I had a dollar for everyone. Every time someone has said, I wish I could write like Annie Lamont. Oh. And I say, well, you can't <laughs> because only Annie can write like that because she's herself. How do you think voice happens? Voice, oh, you know, it's funny because when I was coming up as a writer, I really thought that if I could just sound more like Isabella Allende, <laughs> um, people would like me more and, and take me more seriously. But what am I gonna write, you know, magical realism in, in somebody's trailer, my brother's trailer park, um, you know, where the toaster suddenly shimmies with illumination and, <laughs> and ghosts. <laughs> um, and I, little by little by little, I just had to rem learn and remember that all I have to offer you is my truth and my version of things. And I can only tell you the truth in my own voice. That doesn't mean with fiction, I can't create regional characters and whatnot, but then I have to help, I have to find their voice. And the way I do that usually is to find someone from their area or their era and, and ha get them talking so I can kind of you know, get into the rhythm of, of how they speak and what they think about and what they say. But um, with my own voice, it's another thing. I, I was just taught that if I sounded like more illustrious people, mostly East Coast white males, yes, then I would be more highly respected. And it wasn't true. And it, that all the people that were able to do that might have had a little flurry of attention and it probably lasted for one book. And then people thought, boy, she's, he sounds like he's like up dyke on a bad day or, you know, or whatever. <laughs> so that your own voice, I mean, I just want to convince people it's the voice that you have been given with which to sing the songs that have come through you and that you have just maybe gotten a few chords of so far, but if you stay with them, the song will, manifest and the rhythms of the song and the melodies and the and the rhymes and um it's such a it's such hard work to trust your own voice and it's just about the most important thing a, a writer can do okay first of all i just want to tell you how grateful i am I, my heart feels really full i was nervous to speak to you Aww. so i was really scared and thank you for giving me the opposite experience thank you for Aww recharging me and, and uh, yeah, really making my heart feel tender. You're so welcome. What will you learn next? What will I learn next? I don't have a clue. You know, I think <laughs> we all thought during the pandemic we'd learn French or, um, or, more, or more guitar chords or um, Pilates. <laughs> and regrettably, I didn't learn any of them. <laughs> you know, most days it, it was so hard. And yeah. that's the premise of Dust Night Dawn is that all of this stuff is really hard. Reawakening is hard and stopping um, cl climate change is hard. And that, but that we're good at hard and that the world told us that we need to do great things. But Mother Teresa told us no one does great things, but everyone can do great things with small love. And so every day I did do some small things with great love. I really did 
get a lot of money and attention to food pantries and my very old dog, you know, <laughs> and my grandchild and my Sunday school kids by Zoom. And, you know, we do what's possible. And, um, you know, mostly I was just trying to keep the patient comfortable because I was so enraged in all of 2020 for reasons we need not go back into right now, but I was apoplectic and grief struck. And so I did what was possible and I tried to keep the patient comfortable. And, um, and so what am I gonna learn now? That's, a, you know, it's funny, I, it's a great place to end because I've had this fitful little flame inside of me that I haven't, you know, camped out yet. And it's about maybe, maybe, maybe being ready to write another novel. Mm. And novels are just so hard. I mean, these books of essays, I think Dust Night Dawn took about a year and maybe a quarter. And then, um, you know, the pandemic hadn't broken out when I finished what I thought was a final draft. Australia had just burst into flame. California had just burned into flame. And so it took about a year and a half and then it takes a year to be produced. A novel's three years and then that same mm. year to be produced. And so it takes a lot of stamina and, stamina and it takes a kind of confidence that I will pray for, and I'm not sure that I have it right now. But see, I have this little God box here that, and, and it's a recovery tool. People um, will teach you if you're getting sober or you're getting over an eating disorder or whatever your, um, your uh, obsessive compulsive addiction is. And you can just take a bit of paper, tiny bit of paper works best. And you write the person's name on it who's just breaking your heart right now, who really doesn't want to even try with you anymore. And you fold it up, I fold it into little tiny bits, or yourself. It could be your own self, your own name. That was I mean, immediately what I thought. I'll be putting myself in the God box. Put your own <laughs> self. I'll put you in my God box because oh, I'll just put on a bit of paper, Jen, and God will know which Jen. And then I fold it up really small and I put it in this tiny box that's God's inbox. And I say, here, dude, or here, mom. I'm going to keep my sticky little fingers off the controls till I hear back from you. And if I have these all over the house and I open them up sometimes and there'll be 20 bits of paper and every single thing resolved. You know, I got a second wind. I got an answer from the person I was just desperate to hear. And so I will put a novel question mark in my God box and then I will wait to hear from him or her if, if, if they think we could do it together. And, um, and in the meantime, I do what we've been talking about this whole hour, which is that I'll be taking notes, I'll be paying attention, I'll be writing, you know, really, really shitty first drafts of really short assignments. I have a one inch picture frame on my desk most of the time. It's in bird by bird. I always told my students put a one inch picture frame and only write as much as you can see. Only that one passage, only that one scene, only that one idea. And I'm gonna be doing that until I hear back from whoever and whatever it is. And all of a sudden I'll go, okay, or I'll go, it's not the time. And um, in either way, I'll go, whatever, which is the fourth great prayer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you so, so much. You're welcome. You're so welcome. Do you wanna have a quick prayer before you go? Oh, thank you. Yes, yeah. thank okay. you. Okay, and I want you to cry as much as you can <laughs> when you get off because that is- okay. So much is stuck inside of you. That's what's going on. We haven't yeah. been able to express much of anything because our lives were so much easier than 99% of the world. And we stuffed it and we stuffed it and we stuffed it. And the very best thing you can do is to cry. But let's just pray. God of love, Mother, Father, God, the three of us are here together thanking you for this time and this opportunity to talk to whoever hears this about writing and about faith and about soul and about renewal. And my prayer today is that I can spritz, help spritz Jen <laughs> back awake through through a Zoom, <laughs> through the Zooming. I'm, I'm spritzing her right now. If you look up, you can see I'm spritzing the plant, Mr. Ron. And I pray for you to provide her with the 
poems and the writings and the prayers and the community where she can feel enfolded again and where she can feel safe and excited again to be looking through a better pair of glasses. Mm. We thank you in advance for your tender mercies. We pray you make us ever mindful of the needs of the poor. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I, I feel so lucky to have had that conversation. Uh, you're going to hear me say this because I've got a few episodes in the can. I know this is the first one for you. I'm going to say the same thing after every episode. Wow, I learned so much. And that's what I want for you from every episode. I want you to get something that you can put in your creative toolbox that you can practice once or twice or forever that really helps you to create out loud. Your time is so precious. It's the most precious thing you have, your love and your time. So I want to make sure that I deliver real value for you. Therefore, I'm going to ask you every time to reflect. Is there anything from this episode with Annie Lamont that you want to make sure and remember to jot down or to record on your phone or text a friend? That is a fantastic way to teach somebody else, put it in your own words, to really remember something and make it yours. I also love post-it notes with little reminders that I keep around for a few days or a week until they get all crinkly and, you know, splattered with coffee, (laughs) just to try to remember some ideas. Encouragements. We have to remember most of all as creatives that we're not alone in our struggles. We're not alone in our weirdness. We're not alone in our K-fucked inner voice. (laughs) Hey, and can I do that thing that all podcast hosts do? Because it's so important for a new podcast. Can I ask you to go give it a review? Just go over to iTunes and pop a few words in about what you enjoyed about this episode. That would be so cool. I try to make that like a weekly practice where I review a couple podcasts, a couple of people's books. Just try to look for a way to support other creatives. Sometimes it makes me feel really good. And guess who we're having next week? Oh my God, I'm so excited about next week's episode. It's with Reese Palmer, country music singer who is on a mission besides making incredible music. She's become a voice for black country music singers and the reckoning that is happening and not happening in the country music world. So we're going to have an a incredible conversation. If you need a taste beforehand, look up her video, Seeds, but be ready to cry. And in the meantime, what are you going to do? You're going to create out loud. Have a great week. <laughs>